From Tally to Cali, it's time to wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Warchant.com is your ultimate seminal sports source. And this is Wake Up Warchant, presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. One more corner pocket. Now here's Warchant.com's ass on Hunch of Andy and Corey Clark. Wake up! What is up, everybody? It's Wake Up War Champ, presented by Corner Pocket Barn Grill. Coming up on today's show, a huge mailbag. The offensive line, any concerns on development? The wide receivers, is there a significant drop-off from last year? And generating discussion sparked by Cummins, the top question from the mailbag, we showcase it. Wake Up War Champ, presented by Corner Pocket Barn Grill, Tallahassee, Florida, cptallybar.com, the website, 2475 Appalachian Parkway, physical address. Lunch special today. I think I, did I screw it up the other day and say it was a cheesesteak sandwich. I think I might have jumped the gun. It's Thursday today, everybody. So it is a cheesesteak sandwich today for real, for real. Chicken or steak. Side dish of your choice. Only $8.99 at the Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. Go check it out. Friday, 5 p.m. sharp. Meet and greet over at the Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. Jeff Cameron, Corey Clark. Perhaps myself. Perhaps Ira Chauffel. Perhaps others. But we know that Jeff and Corey will be there. And that's they're the big ticket. They're the talent. That's who you guys want to see and talk to. So come on out and say hi. And uh, maybe come back on Saturday after the game. Hang out up top or go downstairs to uh, the Seventh Hill Tap Room. Can't go wrong with either of those choices, right, Corey? That's right. Well said, Aslan. Well yeah. said. Thank you. And also tonight, bingo night. So um, go go play bingo and then check out warchant.com for practice observations from Ira. From Ira today, so that's right. Yep, yep. He did it. Uh, he did it on Tuesday as well. How come you didn't do it? He's an observant fool. Uh, because I was out. I had. I was meeting Stephanie and some friends. Oh, okay. okay. So uh, and you did the I, podcast. And I did my too. observant on the podcast. Yeah, right on, right on. Warchant.com, Ultimate Symbol Sports Source, five star rating and review, please. Thumbs up as well. Just helps ping it out there. Let people know we're doing a little bit of a show. Come on, hang out with all of us. Corey, how are you? I'm good, man. I'm. I'm. Well, that doesn't sound. Let's do that again. Can you convince me otherwise? I mean, come no, on. No, it's. It's. I uh, look. Hey, uh, Brady got a, had a good game in his last JV game of the season. That was nice. Uh, he was in a bit of a slump, so it was good to see him take some changes. We were working on with the stance and the swing, right. and take him into a game and uh, got himself a, a ripped base hit. He's like uh, Scotty Scheffler, right? Like that back foot of his always comes unglued. Is that the yeah? Problem? He, needs to, he needs to be a little. He needs to keep that thing planted yeah. um but uh yeah my shoulder man it's just it's nah. it's it's bothersome to the point now that i think i'm gonna have to go back in and have them look at it i don't know what they're gonna do i really don't want to have surgery um uh, but it just it's painful anytime i try to do work i like if i go and get shoulder surgery how long am i gonna have to go without lifting a weight a year no, but probably a good six months i would think well that sucks yeah. then it's like all the work was for nothing and guys I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen David by Michelangelo, mm. minus the – I mean, I have arms. But uh, and isn't that the clothes. one that doesn't have arms, or is that Venus to my – which is the one that doesn't have arms? David? No, it doesn't – David isn't, isn't he, like, touching his face, like his hand up at his face? I'll, let me – You can tell – hey, you know what, guys? This ain't an art history podcast. <laughs> <laughs> you signed up for the wrong thing if you thought it was that. I thought one of them did David have has arms. hands. David has hands. <laughs> okay. Um but yeah, but uh, you know what? What would be? If, I'd hate to take six months away from doing it. So I'm I'm gonna take it easy for about a week and a half, and just see if it gets better on its own, like my heel did, and like my bicep did. So maybe it's just a part of being old. I got to deal with some pain. I really think. But other than that, I'm 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 doing great, Aslan. You know, you're gonna go like to an orthopedic doctor. I would think. And sorry for talking uh, health, everybody, on, on this part of the podcast. Although I would implore everybody out there. If you're gainfully employed and you have health insurance, you're lucky. Be thankful. Be grateful for that. Also, use it and, and go get your yeah. annual physical, everybody. Let's get our blood work. Let's check everything. Let's make sure we're doing good. But I would like to think, Corey, that you could probably do a lot of what they call prehab, sort of like physical therapy stuff. There's all sorts yeah. of weird work exercises that can target impingements and certain things that are going on in your shoulder. Because you'll, you'll need to strengthen other like supporting muscles and things like of that nature. I think they can probably draw you up something that won't be invasive and involving having to cut you but open. But I bet it hurts. No, I mean, it's going to be, it hurts. you know, it's, it's, it's going to be a little, it's going to feel a little different at first, you know, just like when you first started working out, cause you're going to be firing some muscles that well, haven't look, man, been I'll just, I, I've decided I'm just for the next month, I'm going to work on the abs. Okay. It's just going to be an ab show. All right. uh, it's just going to be a straight ab. By the way, I looked it up. It's Venus de Milo yeah. that I was right. doesn't have any arms. Think about Venus de Milo that I noticed. And again, it's because I think it's just the, where I am in the, in my life right now, Venus de Milo kind of known for not having arms and then the breasts. 
Mm. But she has a six pack. Does she? I mean, I don't know what was going on back in the day. Apparently, everybody was just walking around with eight packs. Just Not a lot of carbs for days. No carbs, no processed. Well, that's a good point. Yeah, no processed good foods, point. you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, she was probably a fox, Venus. Very yeah, tall. Looks like it. I mean, I don't know. I could get a. I could get past the not having arms. Yeah. When the when the torso looks like that. Yeah. All right. Well. Now it's on to football. Let's talk about cyborging and Frankensteining a team together and putting arms and legs and building Mm. this thing from the ground up. So apparently Florida State's going to sit this one out, at least this week, as part of the infractions from the um, NCAA's investigation late last year, early this year, into uh, their recruitment of a player. Uh, So part of it, partial loss of – partial loss, but loss of scholarships over the next two years, which will spread out, won't be a big deal. And then there's – uh, certain dates that they're, they're they won't be able to take full advantage of the calendar. They have to sit out one week of the spring. And wh- why do you think they're going to choose to do this first week, Corey? Is it maybe because they're still practicing and playing football, and you know uh, they can have all these high school kids still, I guess maybe come on campus and check things out? Or actually, maybe they probably can't even do the high school kids either. I would think. Uh, any educated guess as to why we're we're choosing this here and now to uh, not be able to host recruits in the uh, transfer window? Um, you mean like doing it the week of the spring game? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I, I really, honestly, I don't. I, I don't. I don't know why they would do it then, yeah. and not, uh, not do it. I don't know. Next week or last week seems like it would have made it make more sense to have them on hand for the spring game. Maybe they don't want to see a stadium under construction. I don't know, buddy. It's, mm. a, it's a good question. I don't have a, a good answer for it. Clearly, our guy Tennis Sump in the Renegade Express. Do you think the players that have gone into the portal? And we'll get to all the questions on the Renegade Express. Do you think these players that have gone to the portal from other schools know that we cannot reach out until Monday, or could they feel snubbed and look elsewhere? Um, nah, come on. They know. Uh, it's like you're grounded. Yeah. Like, you can't come out and play. It's not because you don't like us anymore. Uh, just mom and dad grounded you, so you can't come out and play. I get it. You're still my friend. Like, all right, I can't come see you right now. It's fine. Um, if there's interest, uh, yeah, they'll I'll know be the here. Deal. Yeah, it's they'll Florida State, deal. man. I'm yeah. not – yeah, this isn't um, – you know, you're not Toledo trying to ha- have a kid hang on. Wait for us, man. Come on. Come on. Wait for us. You know? And also, like I think we talked about, it's not as big a uh, a wave of portal entry guys. And it's one week. It's a it's dumb. The whole thing is dumb. It's ridiculous that Florida State, maybe the last penalties the NCAA will ever sanction, <laughs> happen to be this stupid thing about, you know, they even said now that that, that came out today or it came out uh, Wednesday, Aslan. Not only did the NCAA make it, Completely legal that you could transfer from school to school without any uh, – you could transfer uh, every year and be eligible immediately. So, uh, sorry, Daryl Jackson. Mm. Our bad. Um, and then uh, – but, hey, it actually worked out for Florida State, if you want to be selfish. They they went 13-0 and without him, and if he'd had a good year last year, he might not be here this year. So, it looks like it might have worked out for Florida State that that happened that way. It still was ridiculous. It was just dumb. But then also, um, they said that uh, they, they will. The schools are now allowed to work with NIL companies, um, mm. and that's legal now too. They're allowed to foster relationships between their NIL and players, which is essentially what Atkins got uh, hit for, right? Yeah, just setting up a meeting with a with an NIL. Right. Um, you know, nobody's fault. I guess it, technically it was Atkins's fault, but I mean, it's legal now. So they're still being punished for something that is legal now. It's just, it's dumb. It would be like somebody right now in Colorado being in, incarcerated for the last, I don't know, 15 years for selling weed. <laughs> it's legal. Why is he still in prison? I'm assuming it's a he, it could be a she. Why are they still in prison when it is now legal? Why is Florida State still having to serve a penalty for something that just on Wednesday was deemed uh, legal for everyone to do? Because you broke the rules when it wasn't legal. All right, man, just get over yourselves. Hmm. Uh, Ira adds context of the fact that over on the Tribal Council, which you should subscribe to and get full access all the time, so you don't have to wait for me to read Ira's words to you, everybody. But uh, uh, it's uh, they won't have electronic communication with prospects. So they can still send. They can still send mail. Snail mail, baby. Yeah, handwritten yeah. notes. Maybe a uh, uh, like a plane, like uh, air. Carrier an pigeon? Air message? Ooh, like, yeah, banner on the back, like the Fire Al Golden banner kind of thing? Well, I was thinking, no, something, you get a plane to spell out something with its oh, tail. You know yeah, what I mean? With its tail know, smoke chemtrails, thing. Chemtrails, Corey, you know? Yeah, eh. you could do that. Eh. That's happened before. 
All right, let's dive into this stuff and then let's see what question helps trigger and does the best at generating discussion sparked mm. by Cummins. Win some free swag, win a free generator, power station possibly. All you got to do is go to Instagram, follow our friends at Cummins at Cummins Lifestyle. First question, not the winner. Great avatar though. Bert as Smokey. Um, right? Or is he the bandit? The car is the bandit, right? Uh, Dayton Noel. Well, no, no. He's the bandit. He's the bandit. Smokey is the people on his tail. Ah, yeah. look at that. I'm sorry. I didn't know that, everybody. I apologize. It's all right, man. It was a f- movie's 45 years old. Uh, I know it because, obviously, I like Florida State and I like Burt Reynolds. Aslan doesn't. <laughs> he made that obvious. He thought the bandit was the car. On headlines this week, Jeff Cameron mentioned the transformative power the war chant triumvirate has wielded over the past few years. Do we really believe Corey's biggest contribution was eliminating punt stats from the Jimbotron and not single-handedly rescuing our football program from the metaphorical elephant graveyard by simply asking the question last year? Two years ago, actually. Yeah. Have we stopped to appreciate just how powerful Corey's journalistic acumen has been? Just how many losses have we endured since Corey got us on track? Not many, uh, and we don't count the Orange Bowl. So I think it's been like, I don't know, four, eight, eight maybe six since that happened. They lost three more that year, I think, because they finished five and seven. Next year, they they lost three. Uh, and then the year after that, they lost zero. So they've lost six times and one. I'm going to do the math real quick. Five, 15, 28. So they're 28 and six since I saved the program. Uh, but no, I would still say what I did for the video board. Do Again, and, and also I brought this up on headlines, but not everybody listens to both. I want to give a sincere shout out to the people at Hauser for the changes they made to the video board. Mm. They, they There is a lot of real information there. It is not just two-thirds of the screen being taken up by Connor, Connor Whitaker's face. It is actually real information for the hitter, too, from the other school. Like, it's it's good. It, I, I like it. I like what they've done, and I just wanted to commend them that they made it more like an actual base. They made it like an actual baseball game where you go around to other stadiums and you don't you see real information on the video board. So I've cleaned it up. Look, I got I got things taken care of. I think they're doing great at softball. Uh, don't need my, uh, my opinion at all on that. But, uh, yeah, it was good to know that uh, I don't know that I got it changed at football, but I'd like to think that – those punting stats did disappear shortly after I became very, very loud about it. Mm. Correlation causation. Mm, yeah, Scholars are going to argue about it for decades, probably. Bourbon is your friend. It's Dave, everybody, Bartstown. I always wonder if you're going to go to him early or late. <laughs> I feel like you go to him early. Well, he's, he usually jumps in early. Oh, okay. All right. So that's we fair. usually go first in, first out. Yeah. The uh, reason I jumped to tennis, um, who's near the bottom of the bag, was because he asked something that was relevant to the initial discussion about the transfer portal. Um, by the way, yeah, not a lot of sexy names out there. I mean, Cormani McLean, not sure mm. if there's interest right there. You really should check out the PRB. Matt Lassier working for you folks. He's got like charts and everything, graphs. Uh, whether Is or not- it McLean from Florida? Yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. I think it was like Sam McCall's teammate. They apparently didn't get along, so that's kind of why Florida State was not. Maybe that's a good sign. Yeah. Hey, but I don't know Miami like finished runner up to Colorado, mm-hmm. but then I don't know. Miami apparently is going to throw more than four hundred thousand dollars at that running back from Oregon State, probably. So, yeah. um, which again, you know, I never liked the Yankees growing up. Uh, they don't like the Cowboys a lot growing up either, but. Because it was always like, man, they just spent all the money. Like, you know, what, what are you going to do? When you spend all that money, you're going to win. And I don't like the way the, the current climate is in college sports, everybody. I don't. I think that's obvious. I understand it. Like, I'm glad my team's doing it. But I also am trying to be hypocritical and, and thinking that if Florida State wasn't th- thriving and flourishing right now, it'd still feel the same way. Well, listen, man, like Miami obviously has money. And they, yeah. they, they put a lot of it into, again, that quarterback – when there's a guy out there that turns down four hundred thousand dollars, apparently, and again, who knows if it was like a lump sum or fifty grand, and then he has to hit accelerators to get there. But when that guy turns down apparently an offer that might add up to four hundred thousand dollars, and it has a visit lineup to go to Miami, apparently they've got money too, uh, and they're not winning football games though. No. So it's it's one thing just to spend money; it's another thing to spend it wisely and and you know. Win football games, so well said. Well said, Aslan. Good job, everybody. Uh, that helps fuel uh, the the three letters that fuels 
uh, the big three letters of this university. Anyhow, it's Dave. When I think of a generator, I imagine a loud, noisy engine pumping out fumes next to my tailgate. Then I remember that Wake Up War Chant live show where Aslan powers entire setup with a Cummins portable generator. It was actually the portable power station. And I really didn't hear anything, to be honest. Given how quiet the Cummins portable generators are, what is the top quiet player in Florida State history? Jordan Travis, pretty quiet, but mm. you couldn't call his play on the field quiet. Same for Warwick Dunn. How about Ron Dugans? Quietly caught 105 passes for 1,520 yards. Wasn't the quietest guy in the locker room. Wasn't bombastic, but he wasn't afraid to speak up. So who would be the best all-around quiet guy in FSU football history? You know my pick, the guy who quietly put up 3,317 passing yards in 1997, Thad Busby. But I have no huh. idea if he was quiet off the field. What do the professionals say? Corey? Aslan? I mean, I, I think the answer is Charlie. Yeah. He was very, very quiet. Um on and off the field. But his play, we all know, was loud. But, I, you know, Warwick Dunn, you know, Warwick Dunn was very quiet and, and, and subdued and soft-spoken. But he had a little uh, flair to him. You know, watch the watch the uh, Ward to Dunn in the swamp in 93. He's doing a little shuffling of the feet at the five-yard line. Hmm. Uh, he, did a, he had an 80-yard run against Miami and then shushed the crowd. Uh, he batted his chest when he'd score occasionally. Like, he had some of that in him. Charlie never did anything like that uh and he was any he, he didn't do he didn't say boo on the basketball court either um so i i would say charlie is the is the is the i know that's a easy one and a simple one and i could go like i could do a deeper cut but i just think the answer is charlie yeah. can you think of anybody else that's you know, rodney hudson if you yeah. want to go yeah. a position that doesn't get a lot of love but a very very good football player that guy was as quiet as a mouse it seemed like uh, but an incredible football player. But he just, you know, he played offensive guard, not quarterback. I was going to say, like, Chris Thompson? Yeah, that's a really good one. I Yeah, it, man, I tell you what, I think I've told this story before, but I don't care. Uh, Chris <laughs> Thompson seemed like such a genuinely good person. Mm -hmm. And he's from Madison County. I'd covered him a bit in high school when I was at the Democrat. And uh, But he just, you heard that he was a good person. And then when you talk to him, he always was, he had a soft smile, warm eyes, really nice and polite. And I remember going to Jimbo because I was going to write a story on him. And you'll do this occasionally when you, when you want to, you just want to verify. This would have been uh, 12, mm. uh, preseason of 12 maybe. And I'm like, is he? Jimbo, just let me know, and, and it will break my heart if the answer is no, but I need to know before I write about this kid, is he as genuinely nice as he seems? And, he, and Jimbo just almost stopped the question. He's like, best kid I've ever met. Nice. You know, and, nice. and just, it's a really cool thing to say. Chris Thompson just had such a warm, kind spirit and was a very, very good football player, too. That's a good answer, Aslan. Thanks. That's, you haven't not told good that as Charlie. before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not as good as Charlie. Yeah. Uh, Kes McCorvey, is he in the mix? I've never, I've always seen him at practice, but I've never heard his like voice like above. No, I like, don't think he. I think he. I think he was a talkative teammate. Okay. I think, yeah. Okay. All right. By the way, that was subdued from Dave from Bardstown. <laughs> it's a normalish question. <laughs> I think he's. I think he's trying to win, Corey. Okay. I'm not <laughs> complaining or complimenting. I, I'm a I, Dave. I want you to know I'm right down the middle. I'm on the fence. Uh, we know where Aslan stands. I'm not. I'm not giving. I'm not playing my hand. I'm not tipping my hand at all. But that seemed like a a, a normal-ish question. Moving along now, Corey. Big mailbag. A big, big mailbag. Uh, lots of good questions, I'm sure, coming up here. But we're always trying to find again. You know, the one that just you know does the best job of generating discussion. Feels like if you want the best, you should probably talk about the best. We got a question that talks about the 2013 football team. So let's go ahead and fire up the cameras. Fire up the generator. Sweet, soothing sounds. Cummins portable generator. Some say, Corey, that you know, if you got something else going on in your life, you might not even be able to hear it going on in the background. That's what some people say. So that's not the power station we're listening to. That's the generator. Right. right. Okay. Got it. Got it. All right. All right. It's generating discussion sparked by Cummins. All we ask you to do is go to Cummins Lifestyle on Instagram. Give them a follow. They'll show you all the great stuff they're working on, whether it's stuff that deals with RVs, maybe even a Hemi and an engine in a big truck somewhere. Uh, but follow them, Cummins Lifestyle, on Instagram. Costs you nothing. Just tip the cap to them. Florida State folks behind this campaign. So uh, they're helping us out. Uh, you can always go to shop.cummins.com as well and get yourself a portable generator, portable power station, and Cummins swag. 
When you win this, everybody, get involved and enter into a weekly or rather a monthly drawing for for coming swag and then a grand prize at the end of the year, which will be a portable generator that you heard earlier or maybe a portable power station. Nonetheless, Corey, the question comes from Philip Morris. If you could trade with the 2013 Florida State football team, what would you trade for, that offense or that defense for this upcoming season, Corey? Yeah, you told me about this question ahead of time, and I, I'm still, as I'm answering the question, I haven't decided. <laughs> I I guess I would go with offense yeah. because it was probably the most efficient offense that's ever been in college football. Um, I know, I, I think that the 19 LSU team with Burrow and those wide receivers broke some of its records, but they ran an up-tempo, fast-paced offense. That Florida State team was not up-tempo and they scored 94 touchdowns um, in, what, 14 games. Y'all can do the math there. Uh, that's incredible. It's an incredible number. Uh, so I think the offense, I think that offense, you knew going into every game that to lose, the other team would have to score 40 points. Even to have a chance, they were going to have to score 40 points. So that's a really nice luxury to have when you're going into a football game. That's how good that offense is, was. Was was I mean it was unbelievable. Am yeah, I LSU, right or wrong, Aslan? No, you're not. You're not wrong. You're right. Uh, that LSU team also played an extra game because of the playoff. Yeah. I try. I want to go to bat for Timmy mm-hmm. and Christian, Lamarcus, Elvin, and Lamarcus, and Jalen, and Darby and PJ. But again, man, like that stacked. You know, that or that screenshot that showed like everybody on the field on offense was in the NFL soon thereafter. Just, you know, I, the defense wasn't far off. Well, I was going to say they had one for the defense too, because all those dudes were in the league. Like every single one of them uh, made it to the league. Uh, so, like, that, man, that defense was great. Yes. Uh, it was great. Uh, I just think that defense had a couple of games, Boston College early on. Uh, Auburn at the end, where it wasn't dominant. I thought that offense, once Damian Craig stopped stealing the plays, that offense was dominant against everything it saw. Everything in its path, it just it blew away. Um, that defense had a few hiccups. That offense really didn't at all. Uh, that's why I pick. That's why I picked the offense. I just, but golly, that defense. Yeah, we we all know Benjamin Jameis, Rashad Green. That offensive line, four of them were drafted. Um, or played in the league. Uh, O'Leary, I mean, give me a break. Kenny Shaw, a really beloved player. The running backs were exceptional. But the defense had, you know, you had Mario Edwards, you had Eddie Goldman, you had Jernigan, you had Christian Jones, you had Telvin Smith, and you had a secondary where Jalen Ramsey that year was probably the fourth or fifth best player in the secondary. Jalen Ramsey. Now, he was a freshman. That's why. He ended up being better than all of them, but LaMarcus, Terrence Brooks, Darby, and P.J. Williams were also all in that secondary. It was a great defense. I just think you got to give it to an off the offense. Good news is feels like this Florida State defense, we hope, would be national championship caliber level. So DJ and the guys, just, you know, watch Jameis, what he did, and just replicate that. That's all you got to do. The, the beauty is it wouldn't have to be as long. It could be a top 40 defense. It could be 38th in the country. If it has the best offense in the country, they're going to win most of their games, and they're probably going to at least reach the national championship game. I was gonna that ask was you, a fun team to cover. Yeah, I was going to ask, like, what is, is the 24 defense closer to the 13 defense or the, the 13 the 24 offense closer to the 13 offense? But, I mean, it doesn't matter because the, I mean, the 13 offense was just – it was a force of nature. It was an absolute force of nature. No one could stop it except for a cheater. And then he got his comeuppance with some towels. That's right. And then Jameis ran across the sideline as soon as the game ended to go rub it in his face. (laughs) I think that was what Jameis was doing. I might have gotten the stories confused over the years. It's been a long time. Congrats to Philip Morris. He enters the monthly drawing for some free swag from Cummins as well as the grand prize of a portable generator or a portable power station. You too can get involved. Just subscribe to warchant.com. Get involved in the Renegade Express thread every single week. 
to generate discussion and go I follow forgot, Cummins. I, Cummins and I forgot to uh I, I left my Cummins swag in Tallahassee. I'm in the I'm in the Atlanta home. Uh so I left my Cummins swag. That's my bad. I'm gonna wear it next time. I promise. Proudly I love it. Back. It feels great. That's it really it. is a it really is a nice it's a nice feeling shirt for real. Yeah. We always reserve the right to change in the middle of the show whether or not uh we're gonna pick a different winner. But for right now, I think that one's gonna hold up, Corey. I think okay. that's going to hold up. Right. Yeah. Shot to Philip Morris. Uh, stop selling tobacco. Island Chief, wake up. Quarterback room has been an infirmary. Regarding last week's question, I am not a Georgia kid. I just sometimes was a fortunate guy who got great opportunities. And the 92 Braves NLCS win against the Pirates, one of my favorite memorable baseball moments as I listened to it in my driveway. Mm. Bream took forever to score. He did. I have become a fan of F1 racing. That's Formula One for the uninformed. And the Premier League, that's... The other football, that's soccer in England. For me, part of the appeal is that they are not interrupted by commercials. Those sports are still played the way they were before television. Football, basketball benefit from television money. I get it. But has the competition suffered with extended commercial breaks? Would Ham's tournament record be better if his 10-man approach had been allowed to wear down opponents? Hmm. Uh. That's an interesting question. Uh. I, I think the I, – I remember um, – I figured it out. I don't know when I figured it out. It must have been 10 or 11. Vital or Bill Rafferty, someone explained during – because I always wondered, what, what, why do they take a TV timeout now? And then somebody explained, I just remember hearing it, that it was every four minutes. Under 16, first whistle after the under 16 minutes of the timeout. First whistle after under 12 minutes, another timeout. And that was all done for TV. That was, that was something that – so back in the day, back when Lou Alcindor was playing – and Julius Irving was at UMass. Um, they they had they just played the games. There were no like, hey, it's fifteen fifty one on the clock. Go sit at your bench yeah. for three and a half minutes. You just had to play. But it's been so part. It's been uh, such a part of my life now for the last forty years. Knowing that that's just that's built into the game is you get you get your. I think you get five timeouts on your own or four timeouts on your own plus four timeouts every Each half. half. Yeah. So you get 12 built-in timeouts. You get eight built-in timeouts and then four other. Yeah. I mean, I it, it's hard to say. It's just like obviously they know that now. But, yeah, you have to imagine if there weren't just these random breaks every four minutes, uh, the ball's out of bounds, it's 15-59, go, go rest for three minutes, um, that maybe – you know, maybe there'd be some differences in, in games. I, I would think that, but I, I don't know. I think uh, it's probably a leap to make that claim but i could see the i could see the argument for it yeah i have no barometer like I, I i wasn't able to witness football like paul brown and the browns like in the 50s to, to know how that played out versus today right. where there's all sorts of breaks you do see with baseball but I, I don't think the the competition is any different but there's like certain games where like when Florida State plays like a midweek against Jacksonville and it's streamed on JU's website, like there's no TV commercial. So that's like you you take the you take the hill and then like man, we're we got somebody already like at the plate to to yeah. swing. But there's so, still a flow to that though, yeah, right? Like yeah. you 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 gotta go change you change innings. You go yeah. into the dugout, the other team has to warm up. Uh so there's still a flow that's always been there. With football, you know, it didn't used to be in the NFL a team would score a touchdown. They kick the extra point. Commercial. You'd come back. You'd kick it through the end zone. Another commercial. In the 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 TV timeouts in football. Yeah, I mean, I, it it absolutely changes the complexion of the game because you do get more rest. I just don't know uh, to what degree if that if that if that makes sense. But yeah, you'd have to think that Leonard running eleven guys at a team that didn't get eight built-in timeouts uh, to to get to catch their legs and catch their breath. It would have probably worn teams down back in the, I don't know, man. I don't know when that started, 84? Hmm. So, you know, back in the 1970s, it would have really worked. Would have wore out Michigan State and Duncan Robinson, right? Oh, well, Michigan. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it would have they, they would have been in the Final Four that year, and then they would have gotten to play, uh, I think they would have played Loyola of Chicago, right, yeah. if they had beaten Michigan. Yeah. So, they were, they, I think they lost that game by four points to Michigan. So there were essentially four points for being in the national championship game. And that was that was the worst of his teams for that five year stretch. That team was like a nine seed. Yeah. Uh and it it was basically two or three plays away from uh getting to the final four. Still more sweet sixteens than Cal in the last six years. 
That's right. So That's right. Way to go, Arkansas. Enjoy that. Old dads and old, wake up. What do you guys think is going to happen regarding the portal after the spring game? Over, under, leaving, six and a half. Over, under, incoming, three and a half. Cheers, old dad. I think under three and a half. Are you counting Jacob Rizzi? Because we already know he, he's coming. He's he's a transfer. The Riz dog. Yeah. He's, and he's a scholarship kid, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. He really needs a scholarship. Like, they know, don't right? give athletic scholarships at Harvard. He right. can't just take whatever academic thing he was on and bring it down to Tallahassee with him. Hey, Come use, on, Jacob. You can use my address. Get Florida Bright Futures. I think he'd yeah, qualify man, for I it. I bet you qualify, buddy. Yeah. You were playing football at Harvard. Um, I would I would say over six and a half for departing. Yes. And under three and a half. Even with uh, Rizzi, I would say under three and a half. But it's, it's a really good number. I think they're going to bring in three to four, including Rizzi. So let's take him out of the equation. Okay. I'd I'd say under, but it would be close. Okay. You agree? Yeah, because if you include him, I would probably I, I would say four. I it'd be I don't know. This sounds weird. I just think it almost seems like if you're trying to win, you have to bring in talent, right? Like you can't just totally sit stand pat unless you're, you know, Georgia, right? And I don't know if you've. Uh, accumulated enough grassroots talent and, and built it up from the ground uh, as well as Kirby's done so far to just be like, yeah, we're good. We're going to stand pat, you know, um, but I could be totally wrong about that. Like, I, I, I'm not saying that Mike Norvell is going to feel obligated to do it, but you just yeah. kind of maybe start looking around and a guy enters in there and you're like, Hey, we, we could use that. You know, Would you take a Gilbert Edmond again? Uh, because what if that's out there? Yeah. That caliber. I think that's – obviously, everybody knows it's a no dust statement to say if a Keon drops out yeah. of the sky, you're going to yeah. take him. But a Gilbert Edmond, I don't – you're not – you got – you know, you got guys like that. You know? You, you've got what we think are two or three special-ish defensive ends, and the other guys are guys. But, you know, you, you want depth. But so, do you go get a guy just for depth, or do you just not bother with it because you might need another position, or you just you're full? You know, I, I, it's that's the interesting thing is like they're not all, they're not all Braden Fisk and Keon Coleman. Some of them are, uh, you know, guys that just greedy Vances. That's what you're going to leave the guy. That's what you're going to leave the door open for, though, right? Is a Keon Coleman type? I don't think you leave a door open for a Gilbert Edmond. Like, maybe if you had a Gilbert Edmond-esque guy at defensive tackle, like maybe like another Grady Kelly, because then that maybe allows you to put Tommy Wadurjaye yeah. like at defensive end. Right. So it's kind of like a two-for-one. Um, but, yeah, no, I'm with you. Uh, I, I don't think specifically at defensive end, but I think if you got a you know contributor on the interior that you feel good about and then you can focus Tommy Wad on being a defensive end, then I, I think you, you would go at that, that Gilbert Edmond average level. Not to be I a jerk, but he's a he's like an average yeah, power right. five football player. Yeah, he was player. a, a backup. He was a backup, yeah. uh, serviceable. He was serviceable. Yeah. That's what he was. I, I would say that, you know, you go in the portal and get a starter. You know, th there aren't many yeah. positions that we've talked about. I, there aren't many starting spots up for grabs. But if there's a guy in the portal that you look at that and say, he could start for us. Now, he might not because Patrick Payton and Marvin Jones are good. But he is a Florida State caliber starter. Go get them, and I don't care what position it is. Add bodies uh, that you're always, especially on the line of scrimmage, you're just going to need it. But uh, I, I think that they feel good enough about what they have. I think what they have is good enough, uh, like we said yesterday, to be a playoff contender. Um, but again, there might, like you said, there might be a couple that put, put push you over. If they're key on you, absolutely. I just wonder if you still hold out. You know, if you're, we'll know, right? Like, yeah. good grief. We'll know in the next 10 days. I don't, we don't have to speculate, but also we'll know what they think about these positions if and when they don't do it, if they don't do anything. Yeah. And if they do do something in a position, we'll know they weren't feeling all that comfortable there. That's, you know, I think that's what we'll find out in the next, that's what they'll have learned from this last month of football practice. I think they need at least one more body on the defensive line and, I just hope Robert Scott is available. Uh, you got Jake Rizzi, man. Come on. That's right. I keep forgetting about the Riz dog. Yeah. So you don't even need Robert Scott. Maybe he'll be in the portal. <laughs> he knows the Riz. It. He knows Stop. Riz dog is coming. Love you, Rob. Love you, Rob. You know that.
Let's go to Mark in Naples. Wake up after hearing about the amazing atmosphere at Hauser for the recent wins against Florida and the Candy Canes. It made me want to move to Tallahassee before the start of next baseball season. Then I was thinking, how much of that energy and excitement at Hauser is related to the recent success of Mike's football program? Maybe fans are more pumped for Link and this baseball team because the football team is winning again and is very, very likable? Or do you think the current excitement around baseball is purely organic, like when Florida State baseball is good and fun to watch, people will show up no matter what? Then I think about the energy at the Tucker Center in 1920 when, well, 2019, 2020, yeah. when Leonard had that all-time team. Football was a mess. Fans were starving for something to get behind, so kind of a different situation from baseball. Side note, who was the MVP drinker at the Jeff Cameron Golf Tournament? Go Knowles. Appreciate you guys, as always. Uh, well, somebody in Stephanie's foursome. <laughs> right. I don't know who, but I can promise you the MVP came from that from that foursome. Corey really tried to be a good husband, coordinated everything, had Steph and her team teeing off behind us. They were on the sixth hole, which was a par three. We were on the seventh hole, so right in front of them. Par five. Uh, that's how we started. That's because yeah. it's a shotgun start, so everybody's at different holes. So we started on a par five, seventh hole. They were on a par three, and Aslan and Matt were late because they had to get gas in their cart. Which, so by they the way, te- sorry, they teed Corey. off four minutes before we did. So they're gas carts, yep. and I hit the gas, and it was going, and then it, it stopped making that sound, and then we made it down the hill because of inertia got us down there. And it said that it was empty. But apparently the key wasn't turned into the on position. Oh. But I, I, how can you move forward with it being off? Like, the whole ride wasn't downhill. Like, we moved 50 yards on a level plane. And Did then when we got knock the, it back into, the like, the off position somehow? I don't, I don't know. But I Matt felt bad did. because, like, I ran, I ran a good 150 yards uphill to get back to the clubhouse. Nice. I'm, I'm like, hey, you know, your golf cart ran out of gas. I'm like, oh, there's no way. And I'm like, well, I don't know what to tell you. I'm <laughs> like, can we get another golf cart, please? And I hate when I say something and people look at me like I have three heads, like I'm dumb. Uh, so I apologize to uh, the uh, cart folks. Sorry, guys. Apologize. Oh, uh, whatever. We, we, we had a great time. But, yeah, so the point being, they teed off before us. They were one hole behind us, and it was a par three. And we were on a par five. Theoretically, they should have been on our butts on the very first, hole, very sec- the second hole of the tournament. We essentially never saw them again. Yeah, they were so far behind us. We uh, we never saw them again. They were they took. I know they took for a fact. They I, I don't know if I told you this that they took an hour and a half to play four holes, <laughs> and then I texted them her and her friend Heather on Sunday because I timed. Um, Scheffler in Homa, how long it took them to play the first four holes of the flipping Masters on a Sunday. It walking, was 50, walking. Walking and not best ball, and it was 51 minutes. They did their first four holes in the Masters in 51 minutes. Stephanie and her friends did four holes in an hour and a half. Best ball. So that they won. They won that question for yeah. sure. I don't remember the other parts of the question. Uh, the energy. I don't – Hauser – baseball. Florida State baseball has like its own – subculture has its own yeah. following. I don't I don't think Mike's success has given Link any kind of win behind his sails in terms of like creating this fun atmosphere there. It's just it's a really cool thing obviously to see. Uh and I, I do think though, and he mentions like it's a different situation. I, I think I think Florida State will would any power five school is going to embrace a really talented, fun to watch basketball team with likable folks that plays yeah. a good exciting brand of basketball and is successful. But I do think that maybe some stu- at least maybe the students leaned a little bit into basketball those three, four years because football was just so downtrodden. So I think a little I do bit too. that was in play. Yeah. I, I agree with that. Yeah, I think they were uh, they, they wanted anything to be excited about. And that basketball team was very good. Um, and that's why I kind of, you know, I do hate nowadays, and I do it, I know I do it, I'm guilty of it. I hate hammering that basketball program too much uh, for the last three years because they were a light – they were a light in the darkness, man. For mm-hmm. for five years of darkness with a football program, they were a beacon of light and, and joy and uh, good teams and wins, which wasn't something you were getting a lot. Even from the – I mean, the baseball team at the end of Mike Martin's tenure, they I know they made Omaha the one year, but they were – you know, they were winning 56% of their games. They were not a juggernaut. That basketball team, it was cool in that moment for the basketball team to have the best stretch of years that it ever had because the football team was so down. But I do agree with Aslan. I don't I don't think there's much carryover. I think that they're their own separate entities, those those three sports in particular. 
I know, think baseball and softball maybe though. Like I think I think the better question, not that I'm killing the questioner, we appreciate it. What Lonnie did got maybe this fan base into softball a lot, and then when they started seeing some of the same similarities on the baseball diamond, mm. they they started to get excited about the baseball team maybe quicker than they would have otherwise. But I don't know how much – I mean, I know there's a lot of crossover between baseball and softball fans, which is why it's so dumb they always play on this at the same time. Um, but, yeah, I think maybe softball energized this bat and ball fan base a little bit, gave them something to feel good about when the baseball team was so bad. Did that put more pressure on – Alford to go after and get Link because, like, Lonnie and softball is doing so great, do you think? I, I don't know. I don't know if that no. – if it did or not, but it's uh, it certainly worked out. I'm glad he yeah. felt the pressure because Link's been pretty good. Hey, go win a series this weekend, gang. <laughs> Winston-Salem. I, you know, who knows who's going to be pitching for you, but uh, – Oh, so I saw, I think uh, – D1 I Baseball's think, got them as a top eight national seed right now. For right now, yeah, but again, we'll know everything. These next two weekend series on the road uh, are going to dictate everything. They're they're clearly appear to be a tournament team. They yes. probably w- seem to be. Uh, the problem is, God, they just let those stupid Clemson games go. Mm-hmm. Like, imagine having those feathers in your cap from an RPI standpoint. Yeah. Like, you'd be two road wins at Clemson. You'd be you'd be the number one in the country in RPI. Uh, it really wouldn't matter what you did uh, at Wake or Duke, but you need you need some quality road wins. Uh, if you go three and three, the next two weekends, uh, you know, and that's not that's not the ceiling. You go six and zero, oh, but if they go three and three, I think they're still right there for a top eight national seed. Otherwise, when you start breaking down the resume, the wins are awesome, but I mean, the number of wins is awesome. But when you start looking at the quality of those wins, with Florida not being good, with Miami not being good, maybe it loses a little luster. I don't know. But I think they're right now. They would have to really hit a dry spell in in drive into a ditch to not be at least a top 16 yeah. regional host. Yeah. yeah, They're fifth right now in RPI currently. So, God, so they would be one. Yeah. Th- they'd be no question they'd be number one yeah. if they had those two wins over Clemson. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know what makes you feel better uh, than winning? Not a lot. Hmm. Not a lot. But Nothing. Vitamin Energy Mood Plus. Oh, there you go. There's the one thing. I Got it. it Nailed it. Energizes up to seven hours. That body of yours nourishes the body with vitamins and nutrients. Also helps burn fat. Supports weight loss. That's right. The tropical berry flavor. Mm, solid. Not even two full ounces in this little bottle of magic. The potion, I call it. 260 milligrams of all natural caffeine. Several different extracts that I can actually pronounce. Lemon balm, chamomile flower, passion flower, rodelia, rosea root, etc. Valerian root. Gets you feeling good. You're going into the weekend soon, everybody. Let's feel good. Maybe we need some help. Works been a little bit tough. You know, Brock Glenn's hurt. Luke's hurt. Wanted to see them. It's all right. Take a shot of Iron Energy. Come to the meet and greet pregame show with Jeff and Tom. Feel good. Feel good. Go to vitaminenergy.com. Use the promo code WARCHAMPBOGO. Florida State alums, all ACC performing in their athletic careers and now in the business field with this great product, hooking you folks up with a buy one, get one free promo code. Again, War Champ BOGO. Shake it and take it. VitaminEnergy.com. All right, let's pick up the pace, Corey. We got, we got several more. Uh, our guy, Bakari, Big B7034. Wake up. Good uh, good day, fellas. It's been a minute. It has, Bakari. Where you been, man? Hope you haven't been on any other websites. As always, I support your hard work and dedication covering our knolls, he says. I've always stated that the team will go as far as the O-line will take them. Alex Atkins has done a masterful job of turning this unit around every year since he's been here. My only concern is that when are we going to see some of the recruits from 2021, 2022 break into the two deep? Who's even remaining from those classes not named Julian or Jalen Early? Is this a concern for you guys? Or should we expect them to bring in two or three older transfers every season? I'm noticing a trend with this unit, and I hope maybe 2025 those trees start to bear fruit, the recruits from 2022 and 23. As always, shake it and take it. Eat at the CP as well. Go Knowles. Yeah, I think I talked about this last season, I feel like, um, because I agree. I mean, I, we all love what Atkins has done, and we all remember what he took over. But, you know, he hasn't he hasn't signed a kid since the first class, right, that has played substantial snaps for him. And we're on year five now. Like, when was was Darius twenty twenty? 
No, Darius was 19. That was a Willie guy. So Maurice and Robert were 2020? No, Maybe Maurice, Maurice was, 19. was 19. He too. was 19 as well. Robert Scott's the only guy, man. Yeah, so And that I mean, was that was a Mike Norvell, I'm from uh, you know, Arkansas ties kind of special, you know. But I also I, I don't want to dismiss like, oh, you don't get credit for Darius and uh Maurice because they were Willie guys. Come on now. They were not who was the who was well, they the OC? Ready. Yeah, it was Randy Clements. Randy the, Clements, yeah, yeah the, the O line coach. Like you, look, those were those guys were molded by Alex Atkins. They became uh, a very, very solid to good college offensive lineman because of Alex Atkins. They were not four or five star ready made, just show me where the weight room is dudes. Mm. They needed a lot of work. They they were unfortunately were thrown into the fire early. Um and that probably stunted their growth a little bit. Uh, maybe their overall ceiling, but those three have been obviously at the heart of the whole thing. They've been there for the entire turnaround. They've been three stalwarts of the program. Um, but yeah, he, you know, Robert Scott is the only guy that they've signed as a high school player since they got here that I'm that I'm aware of that has made any real contribution. So yes, you could look at that and say that is a problem. And I do, that is a concern of mine, unless you're just going to keep going to the portal every year, which is, I mean, it's worked. Um, but last year didn't work as well as the year before, and that's the issue with the portal. They're Not not everybody's Dylan Gibbons. Casey Roddick wasn't Dylan Gibbons. Um, Jeremiah Byers is a good player. He might not be the best offensive lineman that was in the country available in the portal, but he's a good player, but he's leaving. The All these guys are leaving. Who's going to take their place? Because it doesn't feel like They've really grown. Maybe they just weren't good enough. That that might be it. I don't know. Or you're thinking about 2023, and you're looking at Bryson Estes, and you're like, gosh darn, we have a chance to maybe win a national championship, and there are these two proven guys out there that I can go get. One guy started at Colorado. One guy started at Auburn. They can play guard, and I know they can do it. I don't know if Bryson Estes can do it. So they go and portal over him. Um but maybe this year they don't because they talked about Bryson Estes and he is getting – he looks good and is getting a lot of a run. Maybe this is the year – you know, you're allowed to beat out a portal kid. Mm-hmm. It, it happens. Maurice Smith does it every year, everybody. He does, baby. He absolutely does. Um, so, yeah, I, I would like to see that. I get, I get the concern. It's not a huge concern, though, quite honestly, because the portal's not going anywhere. So – it, it's not maybe not the best. It could be used against you when you're trying to recruit high school kids. Like, hey man, uh, he doesn't he, look at the look at who he's brought in. What have they done? Who has he developed right, as so, a high school kid? So 21 was Bryson Estes. That was the only offensive lineman they brought in from high school. Uh, 2022, Jalen Early, Daughtry Richardson gone, Quayshon Sapp gone, Antavius Woody gone, uh, Kanaya Charlton gone, Julian Armella still here. And then this uh, 23 cycle, Chris Otto and uh, Lucas Who I think Simmons. they like. Yeah, yeah. Who has a chance. Yeah. And Lucas and Simmons. Lucas Simmons, who I think has a chance. Remember, he was hurt for a good portion of last year. So this is really kind of his first year really getting a chance to be a college football player. So th- there's still bodies out there. There's still guys that they're developing. But, yeah, it's going to be something that's used against them. The problem, the, the question that I would ask is, does it matter? If you could continually go get a starting offensive line in the portal, you're, maybe you're never going to have a Georgia offensive line, but you can have an offensive line that can go win 19 straight games. Because that's what they've done. But again, I guess I would I would counter what I just said and said they weren't having to fill a whole offensive line. They have gotten. You think about the fact that he's he's getting ready to coach his fifth year with three young men who have been on his offensive line the whole time mm. and started for a majority of those five years. That never happens. Yeah. Well, those guys aren't here next year. So you don't just you're not just plugging some holes. You're gonna have to plug an entire offensive line. So hopefully, yes, twenty twenty five is when early or Armella, maybe Estes is this year, maybe Otto, Simmons, those guys at some point have to wrestle away a starting job from the from the portal. Well like guys. to that point though, it, it it feels like throw a bunch of you know, throw a cast a wide net and then hope yeah. you hit on two of those guys. Over the in, in, inside like a two year window, you just need one guy maybe each year, and then f- the other guys are portal dudes that you don't have as much like risk they are taking on. Because again, like Maurice and Darius were twenty were, were twenty nineteen, Robert Scott was twenty twenty, 
So you got three guys from those two cycles that ended up being and, – and, and let's be honest, I mean, they started because you had no other really right. legitimate options. So maybe not the best example, but it, it, I'm not all that concerned because, yeah, I, I really – it does seem like, you know, you can keep this thing humming along in the portal when it comes to offensive linemen because yeah. you, you so know what you're getting. And I understand, you know – You're just probably not going to get a couple – You're not going to get You're Caden not going to have a superstar. yeah. yeah. You, yeah. know, you, you want Caden Proctors. I yes. get it, but, you know, we get – hopefully you, you get the ready-made quarterback, ready-made receiver, um, because Alabama is not getting those guys recently. I don't know. One man's thought. One man's opinion is mm. on. Moving along, random underscore John. Good morning, gentlemen. How are you doing today? Hope neither of you are suffering from any off-the-field injuries or on-the-field injuries. Well, Corey's got that shoulder. but Shoulder, yeah. Oh, let's talk about basketball. He says, most of the team is bailed. Uh, the idea of getting a booster to pay for a competitive team for a farewell gift to Leonard uh, is really looking like a pipe dream. It is. Sorry. With that said, as it seems no one of any notable talent wants to come here to play for Ham, how far do you feel that Worley and the Green Vipers can take us? <laughs> as long as them enter the portal, that is. Uh, will Hamilton get his Hoosiers Disney ending? Or is the man who was robbed of a magical 2020 run destined to continue to see his plane fly directly into the side of a basketball mountain? And why is he? Why is is so bad for him and the team now? Why is it probably so bad for him and the team now? What is it in that question? I don't know. It just says, it just I probably shouldn't even read it, but I just felt like reading all the words on my screen. Okay. So. Um, well, they did get a commitment on Wednesday, Aslan, from a uh, a six eleven kid, three star. Put some respect uh, on Christian Nitu's name. Okay, all right. He's Power from Canada, forward. right? Yeah, man. He looks kind of like Chet Holmgren. Well, great. I mean, he could probably move. Hopefully, he can switch. Well, hopefully, he can guard point guards because that's what you're going to be asked to do, man. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, so they got a commitment from him. But, yes, right now, um, still just the, I guess the portal closes for Ben's basketball, too, on April 30th. Is it, is it done on April 30th, too? Let me check. Because if it is – well, they got two weeks to put a team together. <laughs> like, uh, you know, I, and you don't want it to be like the scene in Major League where they're like, well, that guy's dead. We'll cross him off the list then. Like, you don't want to be picking from the bottom of the barrel, but... May 1st. Oh, uh, yeah. So they got yeah. two weeks. I don't know how many... How many guys do they have on the team right now? <laughs> like, legitimate scholarship guys. How many are there? Worley... Uh, Jameer Watkins hasn't said anything. He's still here. J Jameer's still part of the program, baby. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Worley, J Jameer, um, yeah, Primo's gone. Is Chandler Jackson? Is he uh, still around? I don't, or did he I, leave? I, I don't. I don't remember seeing his name. But what about Taylor Bull Bowen? Yep. Got him. Uh, mm. Baba's left. Primo's left. Kentucky Watt reaching out to Baba apparently. Okay. All right. Um, so yeah. The the point being, yes. Right now, this roster as it's currently constructed, because there's nobody on it. Uh, would finish dead last in the ACC. Um, you've got to think that they are going to at least pump some talent into this onto this roster uh, in the next two weeks. Other and that's when we'll know. But otherwise, this will be a uh, a disaster movie for a final for a final send off. Uh, so hopefully, um, it gets done and he gets they get some players in here. Uh, you're not none, none, They've got two freshmen I think coming in that they've signed. Uh, Daquan Davis, I think, actually signed on Wednesday. The other kid just committed. I think he's a 24 kid. I, they're not. They're. You're not signing. You know, Shaq. <laughs> These guys aren't going to change the fortunes of your program in one year, their first year. So yeah, it it doesn't. It looks dark right now. But you know what they say, Aslan. It's darkest before dawn. So maybe it's maybe the sun's getting ready to break over the horizon. Let's hope. And they'll get some portal kids actually committing. Man, and I saw that a kid from Milwaukee was interested, and I, you know, he was uh, B.J. Freeman. But I think he was he shot like thirty five from three. I think he was like forty percent from the floor, thirty five percent, and then eighty two percent from the line. Well, he'd have but, been the second best shooter on the team. Yeah, I guess at this point, hitting really thirty five percent. That's that's not good though. No, it's no, not it I, isn't. It's not ideal. But he did average twenty one points last year. I mean, did he really? Yeah. Well, yeah, you'll take that. 
Um, yeah, he was 42%, 42.2% field goal percentage, 35.1 from three, and then 82% from the free throw line. Average six and a half rebounds, too. Four assists. Okay. At 21 and four and six. Yeah, yeah. BJ Freeman, yeah. come to Tallahassee, man. What are you waiting on, man? Come on. What are you waiting on? Yeah, him and Jameer, that could maybe cook something for us. Mm. Dr. Noel. I wonder if he's a real doctor. He Pick better one. be. Yeah. Medical doctor. Hoping, hoping you're not one of those PhD people acting like a doctor. Right. Just kidding. Just kidding, everybody. Pick one player from offense. Pick one player from defense that you feel is the most significant loss from last year's team. First put- off, Dr. Noel, don't tell us what to do. <laughs> you ask us politely. We're not a patient of yours. Um, you want to go first, Corey? Yeah, you go first. That was a joke, by the way, Dr. Noel. You know, you know I love you. I mean... All right, so he puts quotation marks around loss. Um, I know, you know, again, this is me, like, compensating for dogging him for so long in his career, but, you know, losing Jordan, that's a big loss. But I guess you're hoping that the the drop-off from him to DJ is not nearly as pronounced as, as some may think it would be. Um, but I don't know, man. I, I, you know, don't want. I'd say, I don't want to disrespect guys that are on the roster right now. But I feel like it's probably a bigger drop off from Keon Coleman to Malik Benson than it yes. is Jordan to DJ. Is that accurate? Inaccurate? I don't think that's unfair. Okay. Yes. So. I, it's, I don't. I'm not saying it's accurate because we don't know. <laughs> right, but we don't know yet. Yeah, right? yeah I get it. I get it. But as we as we sit here on April 18th. That is that is not unfair to say the chasm between Coleman and whoever the number one receiver is at Florida State is wider than the one between Travis and, and DJ. Because again, Jordan was very very good uh, uh, this past year. Clearly, they won every game, and he was he was good in every game. But he wasn't Superman. Uh, he didn't run for a ton of yards. He didn't make a ton of incredible throws. He just made the right throw every time, which is a skill in and of itself. And that's the most commendable – that's the best trade he had is he didn't make mistakes. Um, but I, I think that DJ could be at least a reasonable facsimile of that, give you something like that. He's not going to complete 70% of his passes, but he'll hit a few big more. But, yeah, I think Coleman, to whoever number one is, is a, is a, wider, is a wider gap. On defense, uh, verse. I want to Even say though Fisk, Braden, yeah, yeah, but Fisk, but it's a little recency it bias is, because of is. how good he was at the end. Yeah. He was solid the whole year and then became unblockable the final two or three games. But uh, but I still, the verse was just such a, and he's the guy that changes the way an offense runs its plays. Mm-hmm. Like they they have to account for him. He was somebody they absolutely had to account for. You kind of lose that a little bit. Yeah, but like the counter to that would probably would be the, the drop off from to the drop off from Jared to Marvin Jones Jr. is probably not as significant as and would people say like the drop off from Kalen DeLoach to DJ Lundy is worse or more significant? But I don't know if that's the game that we shouldn't be playing. But yeah, versus, yeah, but versus I, I, right. yeah, versus I think right. versus even if unless Peyton takes a huge jump, which again can happen. But, you know, none of the guys on that defensive line that I, I think right now, anyway, again, April 18th, are going to be sniffing the middle of the first round uh, like Jared versus. I think many of them are NFL players, but special. Jared Verse was just special. He was just a game wrecker. He was a game changer. We'll see if Marvin and Patrick become that, but we, we have no way of knowing that yet. Yeah, there we go. Keon Coleman and probably Jared Verse. Will those be the two highest drafted guys, though? I think Fisk might get in the middle of Verse mm. and Coleman. It sounds like it. I haven't seen yeah. a lot of buzz on Keon recently for whatever reason, but you know we got another week. Let's get that uh, promotional train back uh, running and humming along. That's right. Hate Canes. H eight Canes. Hate mm. Canes. Wake up. Looks like Corey feels strongly that we need another wide receiver. Is it possible that the room as a whole, across the board, is much stronger than it was last year, thus giving the appearance that no one guy seems to be standing out? For example, maybe wide receiver one doesn't look so much better than wide receiver two this year because wide receiver two is better than last year, less disparity. Maybe wide receiver three. You could make that argument that maybe you could. I don't even know if you could do that. I think you make the argument that wide receivers four, five, and six could be better than last year's wide receivers four, five, and six. But nobody on this roster right now is better than Johnny Wilson, uh, and that was your theoretic. That was your number two last year. 
Um, you didn't really have a number three. Who was their number three? Jakai, who didn't play but half the season? Deuce. Like it, would, it would have been yeah, Portier, yeah. but he was hurt. Um, so, yeah, no. Look, man, I, I, I like I said last show, and I'm not going to keep harping on this because I'm not hammering the kid because he has a world of potential and could have a great future. Both of them. I'm going to say both of them. Hakeem and Vandrabius. Mm-hmm. I would have liked both of them, so from what we've seen, to taking a bigger step than it looks like they've taken. Yep. Um, yep. It, that's all. That's just how I have to say it. I, I, right now, I don't think they are starting wide receiver calibers at Flor- F- Florida State. They're also both second year players uh, that that were both hurt for a good portion of last year. Didn't get the reps. They're still getting back into the flow of things, and the world is ahead of them. They could both be awesome. They could both be awesome by August. Just this April left me wanting a little more. Absolutely. No, it's fair. From, it's fair. From man. those two guys. So I, I thought you'd see a bigger step from them, but I, this might just be the natural progression of things, and it was just me wanting something that wasn't going to happen. But if Hakeem can 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 come close to maximizing, uh, then and Malik and Jalen Brown and Vandravius, then you're looking at it. And, and I'd love for Destin to be healthy. Like, that's another one. That's a key. Like, I don't know his prognosis. Don't know when he'll he'll they expect him back, but I would say if they do decide to go in the portal for a wide receiver, it might be because they don't expect him to be back anytime. I don't know, yeah. but I know that with Destin, I like this wide receiver room a lot more than without him, and they've been without him now for what two weeks? Is that when Norvell announced that? Sounds about right. Yeah. Um. So that was a bummer because I think Destin had a chance. Uh. He he was starting to so, show some like special sauce. And uh, that was just a bummer that that he got hurt. Uh, hopefully he's okay and he's he's back full go and ready to go for the season. Uh, the the game, you know, the the practices that actually matter in in August. But yeah, I I don't think I'd argue that I think right now from what I've seen that if there is a that you are not going to say no to a Keon or Johnny if they become available in the portal. Just you can't afford to. I think. Jakai. Had 14 catches last year. That was third most of anybody that was not a, f- a running back or yeah. tight end behind Keon and John. It was a two-man show the whole season. Um, kind of like 2013. I mean, I know it was a three-man show, but nobody else, no wide receivers caught any passes that year except those three dudes. Really no wide receivers except Ja'Kai in the pit game um, did anything of note. Uh, so that, you know, Darian, Kentron, I, I've talked glowingly about Jakai with good reason. He's been awesome. Mm. So he's there. He's a guy you can count on. And, and God bless him for the way he ran and the way he played in the Orange Bowl and just for being there. Um, but, man, you, you want you want Darian, you want Kentron to step up. Deuce, these Deuce. guys that have been around for a while, somebody's got to step up and take the reins. I think Kentron is probably the best bet, and I think Kentron is a good college receiver. I just want to see it more consistently. Feel me? <laughs> I do. I do Feel indeed. Uh, armchair Osceola, wake up. What a nice spring bonus FSU baseball has become. It's going to be fun watching this team make some postseason waves. Mm. Amen. Right. Amen. Question to you, gentlemen. Looking at the first three games of the year, I could see a situation where a team striving to integrate finds themselves in a dogfight with either Georgia Tech or Memphis, teams that found rhythm late last year. Given a 21-21 score in the third quarter against such a team of those caliber, which player currently on the roster italicized bold font Hmm. do you think, parenthetically, most likely will be the go-to guy? Who do you hand or pass the rock to? Is it Ja'Kai? Is it Cam? Is it Malik? And will they move the chains? Or do you leave it in DJ's hands and he'll do whatever he needs to to get the job done? Drink your vitamin energy and go Knowles. Uh, I think 21-21 in the third quarter against Georgia Tech. Um, I, I think I think you got two guys that immediately come to mind. Three if we want to count Malik. But I think it's Toa Feely and I think it's uh, Ja'Kai. Which, again, that's not something – I know that doesn't excite you guys because you know those names and they've been around forever. But also appreciate – that Ja'Kai, Ja'Kai, when he's healthy, is a dude. He's hard to guard. 
He's hard to cover. He's not a guy that's going to catch 50 passes on jump balls, but he is a guy that can make huge plays for you, and if you get the ball in space to him or his brother, one of them is going to probably make a pretty special play in a game, or two or three or five. And then Toa Feely is just Mr. He's consistent, and he makes big plays for you. And so I don't, But I don't know if they're going to have a just throw it up and let four go catch it like they did against Clemson in overtime. Mm-hmm. I don't think they have somebody like that on their roster. So I don't think they're going to have just a, hey, let's just get the ball in his hands and get out of the way. I think they're going to have to scheme it up, be well coached, and maybe Malik Benson turns into that guy because he did he did look like that guy on Tuesday, Aslan. Yeah, he, some he, of it. Some of it he, was emerging, yeah. He fit right in with Keon and Johnny with some of those catches. Mm-hmm. So maybe he's becoming that guy. I mean, he made three great catches in 11-on-11, 11 11, like real situations, not just one-on-ones. So maybe he is becoming that guy. Yeah, I wonder if you asked, like, Norvell off the record if, if he knows who it would be right now or – or would it be one of those things where we talked about on the show the other day, like it's plays versus players. Like, you know, that Clemson game, it's like, just give it to Keon. It doesn't matter. We're not going to draw something up special. It's just find Keon on this play. Like let's run the play that Keon's best at. I, I feel like at this point, it's like you trust the coaching staff, like let that keep you warm and, and fuzzy and optimistic. Not that their players aren't capable of it, but just, this coaching staff figured out a way to move the ball against a pretty good Louisville team in a really wet, cold, rainy day in, in Louisville with a true freshman who knew he was starting, like, what, 36 hours maybe before kickoff? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I just – Mike Norvell, that's uh, that's the that's the person yeah. currently on the roster. Uh, that's the go-to guy. Like, just dial oh, it up, man. Well said, Aslan. Dial well it up. Said. Yep. Jet jet sweep to somebody setting up a. I mean, we know third and six. Third and six, he can do whatever he wants. He'll run the ball on third and six. Mm-hmm. He'll throw a screen on you on third and six. Because he knows he'll go for it on fourth down. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I know you're not panicking, armchair, not Osceola, and I get it. But I, there's, I haven't seen anybody over 12 practices where I'm like absolutely for sure him. And that's not but, a bad thing. It's just, you right. know, they're, they're it, figuring it, it out. And going back to that other question that was asked about the receiver room as a whole, I don't want to I don't want to get it twisted. It's not a bad receiver room. They're, they're, they have different body types. They have different skill sets. Some guys have had great moments. There is a lot of potential there. It is worlds better than what we were watching two and three years ago. Worlds better. I love Keyshawn Helton to death. Mm. There aren't Keyshawn Heltons on this team. Uh, Andrew Parchment would not see the field on this team. Um so I, I, at least not an unmotivated Andrew Parchment would not. So I, I do think that there are some things to really like about this receiver room, but, you know, we're judging on a curve, man. We're, we're covering a team that just went 13-0 and and had those two receivers. And so when you lose those two guys, you want to see something that looks similar to it. And right now, other than Benson, we haven't seen – I don't think we've seen anybody else. And J- Benson and Ja'Kai, I always keep throwing Ja'Kai in there mm. – um, that, that have really stepped up and looked like uh, guys that can help you go win a lot of football games. But they don't look like guys that are terrible. Does that make sense? I just want to clarify yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. They're fine. They've been fine. Malik's had some special plays. Ja'Kai's had some special plays. Everybody else has had up and down days, and they've been okay. But they have not been horrible. They have not been awful. You don't look at them and go, how in the world are they here? Why are they at Florida State? You just want to see a little more production in, in practice. And maybe we'll see it in the spring showcase on Saturday. Mm, well said. All right, home stretch, last few here. Let's get to well, Let's Nor- go. Rapid fire. Come on, man. NE Seminole, perhaps Northeast Seminole. Gentlemen, love your show and all the work you do to bring us the inside scoop. Two concerns I would like your thoughts on. One, I know Jordan did not have the design running production we thought he would have last year, and most think DJ will be more productive in that capacity. However, Jordan always seemed to have at least one play per game showing escapability that resulted in drives being continued that we will miss this year. How big of an impact will that be? Number two, wide receiver play during Pitt without Keon and Johnny. Would this year's unit have done better? Oh, Huh. Lord, yes. Huh. Uh, look, look, man. Uh, you know, Destin played in the pit game, but he—you remember that catch he made? He was hobbling all over the field. He was hobbling just like Destin Hill at full health probably scores on that play where he limps to the first down. Um, no, look, man. And Hakeem was already hurt, right? Yes, I think he had already, he had just gotten hurt a couple of weeks yep. before. Obviously, Keon and Johnny are out. Um, other guys were banged up. No, there's. 
Portier couldn't really go. So, no, Portier and Williamson alone are guys that I think can make plays for you. Uh, we know Malik Benson can make plays for you. Uh, I guess I shouldn't say we know. We, we think. We've seen it in practice. So, yes, I think it would not have had to have been just the Jakai show. It would not just be the Jakai show this year. They got other guys that can really make plays. And don't sleep on Jalen Brown. I feel like he's coming on a bit. The kid, he's a, a redshirt freshman from LSU. A lot of speed, a lot of talent. And he seems to be getting better just like Benson as we get towards the end of spring camp, which is the natural progression of things. So, uh, no, I definitely think they have more capable bodies in the position room. Now, I'm not expecting perhaps all of them to be in the position room come August. Because it's the way of the world in 2024. I'm not predicting anything. I'm not saying anybody looks unhappy. I haven't seen that, but it's a numbers game at that position. And if you got 11 or 12 guys that are on scholarship or 14 or whatever it is, well, you might want to go somewhere else where you think you can catch passes. So, but uh, yeah, they they will be better than uh, they were a season ago in that pit game. Although that was Jordan Travis's most yards he threw for the entire season. Mm. Mm. Which th- that goes back to Aslan's point about the go-to guy. Some of that was Jordan being magical. A couple of those escapes and throws to, to Destin for one, Ja'Kai another one. I think he hit Jaheim Bell with one. Uh, but uh, give some credit to the play caller and the offensive coordinator, Alex Atkins. Without those two guys, you throw for 360 yards against a decent team, not a great team, but a decent team. That's, uh, that, that, should, that should fill you with some confidence moving forward without Keon and Johnny that you can still make some plays. But, yes, DJ doesn't escape like Jordan. But I think DJ will maybe put his, I don't want to say put his body into, you know, more of a challenging situation because of obviously what Jordan had to go through. Just feel like for whatever reason, yeah, like Jordan just didn't trigger. Like there just wasn't a lot of like read option. I'm going to keep it. Um, And I haven't really seen anything from DJ that makes it seem like he's more willing to run, but I just, I'm just going to believe because the bar is not that high from what Jordan did last year in terms of like running the ball, uh, like conventionally, willingly, that there'll be more of that from DJ. And maybe that'll compensate for some of the drives that Jordan was able to extend with his legs. Maybe just DJ will do it by sheer force of will and, and getting some tougher yards. Well, and also like just escapability in the pocket. He doesn't have, who does have the, the kind of escapability that Jordan Travis has, but yeah. also a 210 pound linebacker is going to have a tough time bringing DJ down. So he's got an escapability in the sense that I think he'll stand in there more because he knows he can wear that kind of contact and not go down easily. Jordan Travis is a tough kid. I'm not saying he's not. But he's, I would guess, 45 pounds lighter, 50 pounds lighter than DJ. Yeah, DJ's so, also at 230. I think Jordan's uh, at You look at those two guys. They, they're Those are different body types. Yeah, yeah. I, I think they might be – something's up there. there. There's no way they're 18 pounds apart uh, because DJ is also 6'5". Uh, no, so I think DJ is probably closer to 250, uh, but he is hard to tackle. You're right, he my hard bad. To yeah, he's down. less than 250. I'm sorry. Oh, well, get it together, A-Train. Uh, I, I saw some. I, I know, thought I saw some said 235. It has been a long show. Uh, Ubernal, for the rest of the baseball season, can we use the term dinges, dinges dongs for home runs hit by Marco Dinges? We can even incorporate a Cameronism and call them tape measured dinges dongs. Maybe Wait, a register ding? sausage NIL opportunity. Okay, that's not bad. Ding dongs. Dinges but, dongs. Dinges dongs? Yeah. Dinge dongs? How about dinge dongs? Dingers. 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 Okay. I just think it, you know, I'm just. This is what I get paid the big bucks for, Aslan, <laughs> to come up with stuff like this. I don't. I I'll don't say think, it anyway. Go ahead. I don't think dinges dongs does it. I think Dinge Dongs do it, does it a little bit, because it's a play on his name and it's a play on Ding Dong. But it's not pronounced Dingus, it's Dingus. So Dinge Dong isn't bad. Like you play, you hit a doorbell. You make a doorbell sound when he hits a, when he hits a home run. What about? Anybody? What about, what about Marco Yolos? Marco Yolo. Yeah, I don't, I don't, Marco. I don't. I, that's one thing I would, if I could give the animals some feedback, because they just do Marco Polo. Oh, really? Yeah, when he comes to bat, they'll yell out Marco, and then others will yell out Polo. Why not just Marco and then Dingus? That would mm. be funny, right? It's yeah. still the same principle, yeah, yeah, but Marco yeah. Polo, was that, 800 years ago? <laughs> to, hey, guys, this ain't a history podcast either. <laughs> we don't know art, and we don't know history. But I know Marco Polo was long, long time ago. 
All right. Uh, Tenor Knoll, 1701. Uh, Marco Polo. Is this the last one? Uh, no. Oh, come on, man. We well, got, real it's quick, my fault. It's my no, fault. I real, blame myself. Real quick, uh, since we were talking about Jordan and DJ, I should have p- uh, pivoted to this one from Riser Mike. Simple question that should generate discussion. Hmm. Maybe if you got there earlier, Riser Mike. Although, listen, I read all the questions before we do this, so it, it's not first up or whatever just whatever we think generating discussion works best for but this is a good one but we did a quarterback one last week i'm gonna stop talking kind of all right who makes their nfl start first jordan travis or dj Uy ungalale Corey, go that's a good one uh <laughs> generating discussion see, it's generated uh, nothing it's generated yeah, long uh, pauses yeah. uh i'll say uh i'll say travis I think there's a chance he could make one in like week 16 this year. Yeah. Yeah. Just right? yeah, yeah. Yeah. He's got a year head start and I don't think DJ is going to be, I mean, maybe DJ has an unbelievable season and he's a top two round pick, but I feel like he's going to be a, he's going to be a, a, a obvious backup going into his situation in 2025, just like Jordan will be in 2024. And it's just a matter of opportunity, staying healthy and, you know, health of the person in front of you. So I just think Travis will have a head start, and so there's a chance he'll play next year in a game. Yeah. Um, what if – yeah, I'm not going to even ask you another question. Yeah, I'm going to go with Jordan. I'm going to go with Jordan. Okay. Uh, right. Tenor Knoll, 1701, wake up, guys. Last question, long-time listener. My question, what makes a coach click with a school? Mike Martin Jr. came in, seemed like he would be a perfect fit, didn't work out. Link comes in, turns it around rather quickly. Willie Taggart comes in, seems like the perfect fit. I can still see in my mind a video of him in an empty Doe Campbell Stadium doing the tomahawk chop. We all know how that turned out. Mike Norvell comes in, and we see the turnaround. Can you explain? I don't think it's a fit with the school, though. I just think, you know, a fit with the school makes it sound like it has something. Maybe a fit within the program. Um, Look, Willie made bad hires. Um, I don't think he was ready for the for the job necessarily and, and everything that it entailed, um, keeping the locker room, getting the locker room um, where it needed to be. And uh, he j- obviously it just uh, clearly I'm not, I don't need to rehash any of that. It just didn't work out. Uh, you know, Meade had been here for 25 years uh, in one capacity or the other, really his whole life. I, what am I saying? He'd been a Florida State kid his whole life. I just think, um, you know, for whatever reason, I, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know why Link and Norvell work. You, the the easy answer would be, well, Link is a better baseball coach, better head baseball coach than Mike Martin Jr. And Mike Norvell is a better football coach than Willie Taggart. But I don't know if it's that simple. You know, Link, Link, I, I don't know. It's a, it's, a, it's a fair question. I just think it has to do with the day-to-day absolute uh, attention to detail. That is the one thing they both absolutely have in common. And I'm not I'm not even trying to take shots at the two guys that came before them. Their attention to detail, their the, the way they are every day. I think that consistency and their attention to detail is why it's not like Link was struggling where he was and then he was just a great fit for Florida State. I think Link is just a really good college baseball coach. And Norvell went to the Rose the Cotton Bowl the year before he got to Florida State. So I think he's just a really good football coach. It's almost like Florida like Florida State has its own um, its own traits, character traits and qualities that probably combine with those two to make them even really even better. Their ceilings even higher, but I don't think it's a Florida State specific thing. I think those two men would have been successful anywhere that they would have gone after Memphis and Notre Dame respectively. Transfer portal also helped too. Well said, Aslan. Well, for both. Mm-hmm. Good Lord. What, what They bring in 26 new guys on the baseball team? Yeah. Yeah. That, uh, Mike Martin and Willie Taggart are probably like, uh, yeah, that would have been cool. <laughs> that'd have been, that's a cool little trick that, uh, that we, didn't get, we didn't get to take advantage of. Uh, but, again, all their, all their peers were allowed to do the same thing and yep. uh, weren't able to do it nearly as uh, adeptly. So uh, we will bask in the uh, the joy that we got the right guys. So suck at everybody else. All right, that's a wrap for us. I can't believe we're going to do another show tomorrow since the show just took forever. But oh boy. who loves you, everybody? Uh, I think we'll actually maybe even uh, unload an interview because we'll be shorthanded at practice, so we might not have as many observations to share on the pod. So Yeah, we need to play that interview before the spring game anyway. Oh, yeah. He's one of the coaches. Yeah, there we go. Tommy Polly. We'll yeah. get to the bottom of the whole Francis Scott Key Bridge thing, too. Uh, right. Yep. Baltimore native. He's got some insight. 
Uh, maybe. Anyhow, thanks for listening, everybody. Jeff Cameron Show, 1 to 3 o'clock if you want to listen to even more seminal talk. Everything's over at Warchant.com, PRBs, cooking, transfer portal. Mm. Mm, good times. He's Corey Maslon. Thank you so much for listening to Wake Up Warchant, presented by the Corner Pocket Bar and Grill.